Linda Chavez. Welcome to Free to Choose. Joining Dr. Friedman tonight for discussion of free trade are Michael Walker of the Fraser Institute in Vancouver, British Columbia, and Stephen Cohen of the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Cohen, is Dr. Friedman right? Should we keep government totally out of it and allow Adam Smith's invisible hand to operate? It's not even a question of right. It's a question of impossible. We've been trying to keep government out of our economy now for several hundred years. Have we? Oh, I think we definitely have. The How last ten have... years have witnessed the greatest crusade to pull government out of the economy in this country in many, many years. The net result is we have much more of it. Um, this is a, a way of Alexander being... Alexander Hamilton, in his report on manufacturing... Said, get it in came out in favor of, of government, government involvement. And, since and, then, and tariffs on steel were introduced early in the 19th century because course. steel was said to be an infant industry. And it was. It was, and it still is. Are but you saying that there's more government control because we've been trying to get it out? No, of course not. What I'm trying to say is we're fighting against the unreal. We're dealing at the level of ideology right now, that government should go away and stay out of the economy. And we're talking as though in the United States we can determine our own future. For instance, if you take Japan, which has been the most successful competitor to the United States, they came from, frankly, nowhere a couple of generations ago to now have wages that are higher than ours. They Steven. produce superior products, and they've done this with very active government involvement. Maybe they were wrong to do that. Maybe they were right. Maybe, as Professor Friedman said, had the government butted out, they would have done yet better. The fact remains, if we say take the government out, it's like saying let's play football with sneakers and t-shirts and touch, which is a game I like. And the other guys are still using hard shell helmets. You can't yeah, do yeah, it yourself. That's the fundamental problem with your analogy is that the, co the competition that we have in trade is not a competition which somebody loses and somebody wins. It's a competition in which everybody wins. And this idea that the Japanese uh, that as a competitor to the Americans that, uh, that the Japanese in some sense won uh, is nonsense. Look at all the Japanese automobiles on American roads. Everybody who drives a Japanese automobile or uses a Japanese product is a winner as a result of this competition that there has been between the Japanese and the Americans for the, uh, for the uh, sympathies of the American consumer. So it's quite wrong to take this well, sort of military or, or combative notion. Uh, that and, might be right if the whole world did that sort of thing, and that Japanese consumers would have had the choice during the 60s that's and 70s to that's, drive Fords or Volkswagens. That's a fallacy. They didn't. A fallacy. It's a fact. Any, in, in, any individual country by itself, on the average, tends to benefit from free trade regardless of what the other countries do. What you seem to be saying, saying when, in, in, your, in your argument against free trade is that the customer is always right unless they pick an imported item. No. And if they pick an imported item, if they pick an imported item, then they require the help of the government to assist them, to tell them, look, you've made an unwise choice here, and therefore we're going to put a tariff or a quota on to prevent you from selecting the imported article, whether it's a Japanese automobile or a Korean television set or whatever, because you don't have the ability to make this kind of choice yourself. That now, is not what I'm saying. Well, what are you saying, Dr. Cohen? Now, I'm saying there's a problem here. We gain in the very short run. If we assume that this whole place is going to have an earthquake and we're going to be out of business in a year and a half, this no, is a brilliant we gain, idea. We, gain in the we long send run. them paper, they send us cars. We get it, let me finish. If, however, we go in the long run, the first round is Japanese semiconductors come in. Terrific. Let's even assume the Japanese are dumping them. They're subsidizing, they're pushing Absolutely. them in your market. Absolutely. The first thing, we get a lot of cheap semiconductors. Terrific. This wonderful fictional person called the consumer has a gain. However, the same person happens to be a producer. That's how he gets his income to become a consumer. He's suddenly put out of business. Mm. Two things occur. Turns out you can't suddenly go back in the, in the semiconductor business. That is, we've been put out, but we're going to rally and go back in. It takes long time to develop the skills, the know-how, 
the scale. So you're pushed out of that business. Yes, Stephen, we, 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 neither one of us knows what the future will hold. We don't know whether it's wise for us to accept these, these free or almost free uh, semiconductors and use them and to, to develop our industries and so on. We do. But, but we, can, we can stand back and ask, what is going on? What are these Japanese who you apparently think uh, know the future and are, are taking a, a competitive uh, position that says, well, we're going to invest in subsidizing these things and shipping them to the United States to destroy their industry? Where are they investing? Where are they who take such a long-term view? They're investing in the United States. No. And they're investing in the United States because they realize that, for example, in, in the uh, industry that you su uh, selected, the, uh, the consumer uh, electronics industry, they realize that anybody can make a VCR, but it takes, uh, it takes a good, well-developed service industry, for example, to develop the software that's played on no, a VCR. That's and that's why true. they're buying, excuse me, that's Nobody why they're, that's can why make they're a buying, VCR that's why it's the Sony. Japanese. There I know. are no American but VCRs. Cares? But who cares? Sony no, is just, just, Sony is just <laughs> buying MGM. So yes. Sony is buying MGM because they realize that the product that's produced by a VCR is not the machine. That, that's a $200 item. There's a $1,000 item that's made up of the software, namely the, 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 the films that are going to be played on that VCR. And they're investing in America because America produces the, the, uh, the software. Let me interject here for, for a second because I want to ask Dr. Friedman a question. Dr. Friedman, maybe VCRs aren't that important, but what about the defense industry? Should we really keep hands off there or should we step in and protect? Even Adam Smith made national defense an exception. <laughs> but I think that while in principle it's an exception, in practice it's an excuse. I think one of the greatest uh, statements I've heard about this whole problem was by Colin Clark, a famous economist, who said, you know, the tr people say that the trouble with uh, f that free trade is fine in theory, that's what Mr. Cohn is saying, but it doesn't work in practice. He says they're absolutely just wrong. It's just the opposite. Any half-baked graduate student can give you a half a dozen special cases for tariffs. Infant industry arguments, uh, the uh, problem of getting back in, the kind of thing you've mentioned, and so on. The trouble is, that those arguments don't work in practice. In practice, we put on the wrong tariffs in the wrong places in the wrong, in the wrong way. The same thing is true of Japan. You're talking about Japan's great success. Yeah. But let me ask you, does the a average Japanese citizen, you say his wages are higher than they are in the United States. That's only because of, a, of an artificial exchange rate. Quiet. There is no Japanese who will tell you that the standard of living in Japan is higher than the standard of Quiet. living in the United States. It is not. And why, why not? Course, because why not? Because of the Japanese protectionist policies with respect to rice and with respect to land. The average Japanese pays something like six to seven times the world price for rice. We do the same thing in the United States. The sure. average American citizen pays two to three times the world price for sugar. How does the, how does the United States benefit from that? We put on the, once we adopt your policy, we move in a direction whose only outcome is a waste of national resources through centralized direction of our activities. Germany's industrialization went like an express train all through the last quarter of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. German industrialization did not follow the what was then the dominant ideology of free trade. It said, look, oh, well, the on. British, well, please, come on. There was the marriage well, of rye uh, and iron when Bismarck came in. Well, but they were the first, first thing they did. What was the first thing the Germans did? They, they copied they, all they, the possible British technologies. They eliminated, no, but they first of all eliminated all their internal tariffs. I mean, Germany was a was German archetypally, formed its uh, nation. Yeah, yes, by within the, the nation, yeah. they opened up markets. And between the German nation and the rest of the world, they had lots and lots of trade. But they had targeted development. They had strategic policies, not stupid mass government inhibitions. They said, look, the future chemical industry, we go. We push, uh, we push resources and we help the chemical industry. We protect it for a while because the British are well ahead. They did the same thing in steel, the well chemicals, ahead of the and machinery. Yeah. But the if British, you look at it, uh, nobody's look ahead at of the Germans in chemicals right now. But if you look at it, uh, the problem is that we, we, ha we lose our sense of perspective. By today's uh, standard, what Germany did in the period you're talking about, we would today call free trade. They did it. Ah, intervene, well, I don't know what we mean. Whereas, and that's exactly the same thing that you're doing with respect to Japan. You are not allowing for the extent to which Japan's, see, what happened in Japan was between 1914 and 1939, uh, uh, 
Japan shifted policy and became a highly protectionist, a highly centralized, a highly controlled, and its real income went down. In 1939, it went into war, and from after, after the war, it, it did uh, uh, abolish. In fact, n Japan since World War II has been much less of a centralized and protectionist state than it was between the wars. That is probably very true, but and since by World War II... With the United States, in my, by my judgments, the United States is every bit as protectionist as Japan is. I'm not saying the United States is no white. I think we have a lot of protectionism, but we have stupid protectionism. Is there, is there, is there, the question is, is there any other kind? Yes, <laughs> there is. Take a look at Japan, in post-war Japan. If, take a concrete industry, automobiles, because they're mm -hmm. important, and everyone yeah. can understand. Which strategically, Mitty, don't forget, try to suppress. Don't, don't forget that. When you're talking about the, this, this wonderfully uh, intelligent policy pursued by the Japanese government, that they actively tried to suppress the exportation of automobiles because they felt the Japan Japanese was silly, was government Japanese has not batted a thousand in its policy. I'd say they've been hitting about 465. Or just you, you use the example which, of automobiles. One minute, I will. Which a 465 hitter is Nobel Prize baseball. But I don't believe so. they've been batting. I don't. I believe that the development, the post-war development of Japan, is a tribute to the force of free markets in opposition to METI. I think you cannot attribute let's, it to METI. This is all true, but it has no concreteness. This is ideology. Let, let's look at it automobiles. It is not ideology. Is automobiles concrete? are concrete. I can understand them. I can count them. I can drive them. If you look at the automobile market in Japan in 1962, the year I was getting out of college, so I remember the year, the J Detroit produced more cars in a week than Japan produced in a year. That's true. There was no way on earth Toyota or Nissan could have competed with Ford. And if we want to argue that Ford was too foolish to sell into Japan, there was Fiat, there was Volkswagen, there was Renault, and then there's the list of the dead, Austin and the other British. There's also very low Japanese real incomes. Which is it was a smallish market. Yeah. We t how many cars were imported into Japan in 1962? Zippo. They go to 1965? Zippo. 1970? Zippo. 1975? Zip. 1980? pretty much nothing, a couple of BMWs with the steering wheel on the wrong side of the road. During all that period, there was no way the outside automobile makers could get into the Japanese market, either by selling product or by setting up a wholly owned subsidiary, making the well, product the in the Japan market. That is what I call a protected market. It sure is. It sure is. And what happened as a result is the, the Japanese of... automobile industry now makes more cars than the American Not automobile as a industry. result of that. Far from it. You mean despite that? Despite yes. that, of course. That is, it, the government policy, they would have been producing twice as many cars now. I don't know about twice as many. I don't even know if they've been producing as many. But they would have had a more productive automobile industry. Had they, they not would have protected. contributed more to the well-being of the people of Japan. Who could be against progress? That's not what we're talking about. So but yeah, you're but against it. Well, Milton, Quite I think the contrary. I think, I think there is an important point that we're missing here, though, Milton, and that is that we're talking about this as though we're an economic problem. I don't think protectionism is economic it problem. It isn't. Protectionism is a political disease. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it follows the well-known uh, pattern suggested by H.L. Mencken when he said that, uh, that elections are a kind of a futures market in stolen property. <laughs> and who is being stolen from here? It's the consumers who, who have to pay a higher price for the product, and who benefits? It's the manufacturers who get the higher, who get that, as it were, that tax that's levied on consumers. And the problem is that even if they know about it, consumers have no interest in, in going about and, and engaging in political action to stop it. Because for them, it means a few dollars more on a, on a car or a few dollars more on a VCR or whatever. And, and uh, they have no incentive to go out and engage in the political action to, to get the tariffs taken down or get the quotas removed. And, uh, and it's so, therefore, a very insidious and, and, uh, and difficult uh, thing. It's nothing to do with economics. It's a political problem. Dr. Cohen, I understand what you're against. Uh, you think that free trade doesn't work in practice. What are you for? Well, I, it's not a question of free trade not just working in practice. It does not work in theory. Let's be very clear. This films you've been showing. I have never seen anything with quite the ideological content of that, as I said, outside the Middle East. You're it assumes... You live a sheltered life. <laughs> I um, have been fortunate. It assumes a set of assumptions that have been proven wrong. American economics sits around spinning on the basis of its assumption, admitting of no facts, admitting of no foreign intervention. I beg your pardon. It you, simply are, you simply are demonstrating the parochialism of your knowledge. 
the facts in that film are absolutely correct. What Japan did progress very much under free trade from 1868 to 1914. India has remained relatively Misery. stagnant under a si system of policy of protection. Those facts are correct. Those it is are also what we used to call glittering half-truths. The f other half of those truths are Germany in the late 19th century progressed splendidly under and Germany strategic in the policy. Late, and the Germany in the late half, in the last half of the 19th century progressed greatly. It progressed greatly. greatly. And that Japan As Mike, progressed what Mike very was greatly. saying earlier, because it eliminated tariffs within the country, it got a large free trade area in the same way the common market has been moving, in the same way the U.S.-Canada uh, agreement has been moving. It progressed greatly, be, despite the fact that, that it introduced uh, uh, s some tariffs toward the external world. That's the two cases of the most successful rich country progress. Germany in the early 20th century and late 19th century, Japan in the post-war period. No, Japan oh, in, in the, the post-war, Lord two Japan period. One minute, I haven't finished my sentence. The, Japan in the post-war period are the two most startling and impressive examples of truly muscular and impressive industrial. Both, you claim, were achieved despite the fact that they used strategic development policies. I would like to say England and the United States have, despite the fact they've tried to use free market policies, and have not. We've had tons of protectionism in this country. But the intellectual climate that says protectionism, you only have one word, protectionism. It's like people in Florida talking about snow. There's one word, snow. Eskimos have a hundred words for snow. We have one word Just for protectionism. Don't forget. You know that. <laughs> the Japanese have a hundred words, despite the fact that these two countries have succeeded so well, you say, well, had they only done it our way, they would have done better. But I, I have that really I hard have, to believe. You've had the last word, Dr. Cohen.